Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Many people have done that. The reason for that is, and you've all heard this before, right? That, that what you can do if you want to be protecting any of your assets, one possibility is, you, you, the, the, in general, you can give them away. You can give your assets away because for mass health purposes, if you have a million dollars and you give it away to your daughter or to your son or to somebody and wait five years, on the day after the fifth anniversary of that transfer, it's no longer reportable. It's not that it's not countable, it's not even reportable on the mass health form. It's just gone, right? So, and you could do that. You could just give the prop, your, you could give the, she could give her Nantucket house to, to her kids. Now, one of the problems with that is that if she does that and her children then turn around and, and want to sell it later on, they're going to pay a gigantic capital gains tax unless they've been living in the house for two of the previous five years. And even if they have been, because the value is so high, there's still going to be kind of a substantial capital gains tax. So what Mary would really prefer to do is to hold on to that property for that very reason. I'm sure, because this is Nantucket, you've all heard this before too. You want to hold on to your property until you die because at that moment, at the date of your death, for capital gains purposes, the so-called tax basis of the property jumps to the date of death value. So that if your children turn around and need to sell the property, they don't pay any capital gains tax. They may pay a small estate tax, Massachusetts estate tax, but that is nothing compared to the savings on, their, on, their, uh, on the other side, on their capital gain. So one possibility is to keep the property, except that then, of course, for Frank and Mary's purposes, it's at risk, right? One possibility is to just transfer it to your kids, but then you know, they lose that, that stepped up basis. A third one, which you've probably all heard of, is you transfer the house to your kids, but you keep a life estate in the house. You keep the right to live there for the rest of your life, which has one benefit is that then your kids can't throw you out if they're broke and they really need the money, right? But the other benefit is um, that, that for capital gains purposes, for IRS purposes, you still own the property, even though for mass health purposes after five years, most of the property is safe. So when you die, that basis still steps up. The only problem with that alternative is that if you transfer a ho your house interest to your child and keep a life estate, and then for some reason, and you did that mainly to deal with mass health, but you end up being fine. You know, everything's great. You never need mass health, but you need to move, right? You need to sell. Um, at that point, if you sell all of the interest in the property attributed to your child's interest, unless they're living there, is going to be subject to the capital gains tax. Because your exemption for being an owner occupant would only apply to that piece of the value of the house that's attributed to your life estate. And that, if you are 75, would only be about 25% of the value of the house. And that's why, that is why, that's why I was leading up to this, so many people instead will transfer the property to an irrevocable trust, to the tr one of your kids is the trustee of an irrevocable trust. You typically keep a life estate. You've probably all heard this before. Many of you may have these, and that's the reason for this presentation. You, you, you do this, you keep your life estate, you wait five years, and you're safe. Or at least you think you're safe. And I know, because we've done irrevocable trusts for years, and, and, and literally, after I've done one, I'll get calls from the client. Only two years left. Only three years left. <laughs> you know, they're watching on their calendar. You know, when is, when is the house really going to be safe, right? And after five years, it's safe, as long as the irrevocable trust is valid. So it is with that in mind that I want to talk about Roach versus Thorn. Uh, this was a case in which a classic, a, 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 an older woman uh, had created a irrevocable trust and transferred her house. It was the only asset. She transferred her house to the irrevocable trust, and she kept a life estate. And eight years later, she went into the nursing home and she asked for mass health. 
And uh, last year, middle of last year, the caseworker, the Mass Health caseworker, uh, denied the application and said, oh no, all of the house value is countable. Why? Because um, of the, some of the provisions in that irrevocable trust, right? The mere fact that a trust is irrevocable does not, it, it, it has to be irrevocable in order to satisfy the mass health criteria, but that's not all that it has to be, right? It is a necessary but not sufficient uh, bar to qualify you. It also has to be a trust in which you have no remaining interest or no ability in any way to get the property back or to, or, and your trustee using the trustee's discretion does not have the discretion to give it back to you because there is a case that came out, this was quite a while ago, um, in which a court here said, in general, regarding these kinds of trusts, we're not going to use usual trust principles. The usual trust principle is that a trustee has to be acting for all the beneficiaries and has to make sure in, in giving things back to, a, to an older beneficiary that they're also doing what they need to do to try to preserve the assets for the benefit of the younger beneficiaries. And what this case said was, don't, that in, the, in mass health cases where the, where the asset was contributed by the older person who is now trying to qualify for mass health, those rules don't count. The rule is, if the trustee has any discretion to give back any interest in the property to the older person or to, or to give them an interest in it, the property still counts. So using that rationale, this caseworker denied on this case and it went to an, a, a, an appeal. There, is, there are administrative appeals within Mass Health. It's called the Board of Hearings. There have been caseworker cases in the past where this has been a problem, but they've always been reversed at the Board of, at the board of Hearings. This time it wasn't. This time it wasn't. And so this case actually now is pending in uh, Worcester, in Worcester Superior Court. Roach versus Thorne. So let me tell you about the trust. There, there was a life estate. We talked about that. The house was the only asset the whole total house value that was counted. So here are some possible problem provisions with the trust. These are all provisions that were referred to both by the caseworker and by the appeal officer. So, now neither of them said that any one of these in particular would have made the trust bad. They, they kind of used what, I remember I had a teacher that, that said that the, the, the trouble with this kind of case is it's like the vegetable soup you know, version of the law. It's like, well, it's not that any one of these things makes the trust bad, but when you put them all together and stir them up, it adds up to a bad trust, right? And so for lawyers, this is murder because you, you can't know how you can repair this, right? You don't know which one to deal with. So one, and I think, my opinion, the biggest issue was that the, the older person retained the power in the trust to appoint to, to authorize the giving of some trust assets to one of the kids. The kids were the other beneficiaries. She was a benefit, she was, she was, she was, she was, she did not have the right to get any, any of these assets back, but she had the right to appoint, to say that some of the assets could be distributed to the kids. And I mentioned this provision because I've been doing this now for about 30 years. Until recently, until say maybe five or 10 years ago, that was a very common provision because there were a lot of lawyers who would try to convince people to do this who were very wary about giving up an interest in their property, legitimately. You know, they want to lose, you don't want to lose control of your assets, right? And they said, well, you know, you, know, you can give up the tr control, but you're not really giving up control, right? Because the money's in trust, but nothing can be distributed to your kids unless you say so, right? And, and, under the tr and under the trust, you can't actually get the money back yourself, but you know, what you can do is you can tell your son or your daughter, so listen, I really need $10,000. So I'm gonna give you, ten I'm gonna authorize you to give yourself $10,000, wink, wink, because you're gonna give it back to me, right? I mean, you are gonna give it back to me, right? And then if he didn't, well, then you wouldn't do it again. <laughs> you give the money to one of the other kids and see if you get it back. So that used to happen a lot, right? Well, what this, this, this caseworker said, he said, no. He said, in that situation, the older person, the grantor, has retained too much power. And by, by retaining this power to give money away to his, own, his or her own children, 
she's really retained control of the, enough of the control over the money that as far as we're concerned, she still has control. Um, the second one was, the second provision that, that, that was really raised, and this was a really serious one, is, is that the, the trustee was specifically given the power to buy an annuity for the older beneficiary. And, the, pro and the, the problem with that, right? and by the way, what, the way this trust worked is, is you weren't allowed, the trustee wasn't allowed to give any trust principal to the, back to the beneficiary, only income, only the trust income. That's not uncommon. They're called irrevocable income only trusts, IIOCs, um, or IOTs. And, and, and this provision specifically allowed the trustee to give out annuities. And the, and the appeals, and the, the caseworker, and then the appeals officer said, well, wait. If that's the case, then the trustee really has the ability to take whatever's in the trust and turn it into cash, just like what Frank and Mary, what I just told you to have Frank and Mary do, turn it into cash and go buy a big annuity, in this case for the little old lady who was in the nursing home. And so in that regard, even though what, what he has, which he has, the trustee has as an asset is a house, he could sell that house, buy an annuity, and therefore make all of the money go to the, the older grantor. And therefore, under that case that I re referred you to earlier, using his discretion to the maximum amount possible, he could get the money back to the, to the older person. Um, third, there was this bizarre, I shouldn't say a bizarre provision. This is a provision, property replacement. It was in this trust, and it said that the, tru that the, that the, that the original grantor, in this case the woman, had the ability at any time while well, she couldn't get principal back, she could always trade. She could always replace any asset that was in the trust with another asset of comparable value. Now that provision, you say, why is that in there? Well, it's in there for a kind of bizarre federal income tax reason that I won't go through, but it was always in there. So what I'm sure happened in this case is that the, tr the, that the lawyer kind of pulled out an off-the-shelf trust package from you know, what he was usually using for, for, for estate planning tax purposes and left that provision in, just kind of not thinking what's the, what's the difference, right? And, but, when, but here the kid, the caseworker said, well, that means that the older woman could actually get that house back. Now, in order to do that, she'd actually have to give the, the uh, trustee something of equal value, right? And that's, you know, how likely is that? But the point is she had the ability to do that. Finally. There was, a, there was a provision that the, that the trustee had the ability, even though um, the trustee couldn't use the money, give the money directly to the older person, he could use the money to pay the older person's estate taxes if they were there. I don't think that one's really important, but I think the, I think the, the first three, I guess my, I'm just making the observation that, that in cases like this, it, it, it is worthwhile if you, if you have one of these, go call your lawyer and ask, right? Say, you know, if you've heard about this case, I just want to make sure that my trust is still okay. And by the way, by the way, um, I need to kind of balance this off. There was another case that, that j happened about two or three months ago. And this was the situation, and this trust was declared by a different caseworker to be valid, and therefore there was no appeal of the case. Um, there was no power of appointment during lifetime. That was the thing that I said I thought was really bad. Um, the, 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 the grantor was actually specifically allowed to live in the house, but that's like as if the, the, the grantor maintained a life estate. Oh, by the way, that provision, I am going to mention, I should mention this, there are several cases in which that provision has been deemed to make the trust fatal. Um, that, if, that, that instead of transferring the property to the house and keeping a life estate, you transfer the property to the trustee, but the trust says that you're allowed to continue to live there often rent-free for the rest of your life. That has been determined to make the trust invalid in several cases. But in those cases, what has happened, the Mass Health has compromised and they've allowed the trustee to basically give a life estate back to the older person um, and remedy that particular provision. So, so, but in this case, the person was allowed to live there. There was this substitution funny clause that I just talked to you about. Um, it was silent regarding annuities. It was silent. Didn't say that the trustee could, and it didn't say the trustee couldn't. Now, in general, under general trustee powers, tr trustees have the power to buy annuities. So I guess my kind of advice on that, and I'll, just, I'll go, just go back to the list, right, is that if you were, if you were trying to be, if you were, you know, some people can live with some risk. Others hate risk, right?